My name is Andrew Baker and I run the Coral Reef Futures Lab at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. We're really interested in the lab in the response of corals to changing environmental conditions and in particular to environments that change as a result of climate changes. So warming temperatures, more acidic conditions, these sort of marine heat waves that are passing through different parts of the world. Coral reefs worldwide are threatened because of human activity. So how do we restore corals that are going to be able to survive future conditions? We're really interested in, in you know, exploring all the different ways that corals could build their heat tolerance and trying to find solutions that could be scalable and could be effective uh, when it comes to restoration. From a conservation point of view, we're really interested in scaling up in how we can use that science to implement a feasible intervention strategy and how that will play out on the reefs. Corals are really interesting animals. They form the largest living structures on Earth, and you can see them from space. Corals are sort of an ecologist's fantasy and worst nightmare, all rolled into one, because a coral colony is such a diverse community of so many different types of organisms. Corals are really fascinating creatures because they're not just animals, but they're also essentially plants that are photosynthesizing and turning sunlight energy into food. And they're also uh, producing calcium carbonate or limestone skeletons. So you can kind of think of corals as being animals and plants and minerals all in one. Corals host tiny single-celled algae inside their tissues in what we call a symbiotic relationship, which is when both partners benefit. They can actually partner with different types of algae and change their physiology as a result of those shifts. Any change in their environment can affect any one of those organisms or any of the relationship between them and that makes them really interesting to study but also can make them really unpredictable. Something that we um, hypothesize and theorize about corals is that their behaviors and their responses to stressors are somewhat dependent on which types of symbionts they host. This symbiosis between corals and their algae which is really important for understanding why corals are really successful in building coral reef ecosystems in the world's shallow tropical seas. That amazing strength is also their Achilles heel. It turns out that this symbiosis is uh, incredibly heat sensitive. Warming temperatures or unusually hot summers causes this partnership between the coral and its algae to break down in a process we call coral bleaching. The coral turns white and if it stays white for more than a few weeks or a couple of months, the coral typically dies. The interesting thing about this is that different types of algal symbionts that live inside corals actually have different resistances to these kinds of stresses, including high temperatures. So corals that have different kinds of algae can show differences in their tendency to bleach. Clearly this symbiotic relationship is so much more intricate than what we thought before. Understanding that relationship is crucial to really understanding what we can do to help the coral survive in the future. One of the prongs of the Baker Labs research has to do with interventions as it relates to manipulating the symbionts that corals host. You can actually expose corals to a quick dose of stress and that can trigger certain responses on the part of the coral can actually pre-adapt those corals to better survive future stress. Research that we've done in my lab in the laboratory many times involves uh, controlled bleaching and recovery of corals to deliberately change their symbionts. If we can seed colonies with thermally tolerant algae, then they might cope a little better as bleaching events become more and more frequent. We've done a lot of these, what you might call stress hardening experiments, and we've uh, now started to sort of explore their feasibility and utility uh, with restoration. How can we apply the science towards restoration, towards rehabilitating this really vital ecosystem? We've been working with a variety of species of corals. There's some branching corals, some boulder corals, some ring corals. Our target species are Acropora cervicornis, or the staghorn coral, Orbicella fabulata, Montastria cavernosa, and Sideraster siderea. These corals are major reef building corals, and they are also typically integrated into a lot of restoration frameworks and so they're definitely corals of interest. My research involved taking some coral tissue from colonies out on the reef and manipulating them so that they took up these naturally occurring thermally tolerant algae. I then put those pieces of coral back into their original colonies and sort of like a skin graft they healed back in and as they did so 
these thermally tolerant symbionts are dividing and then spread through the coral tissue into the rest of the colony. As temperatures warm up here in the summer, it will be really interesting to see how these colonies perform in the upcoming bleaching events. Not all algae are the same. They have trade-offs. So one may provide a thermal tolerance where another may help growth rates. What are the trade-offs? Do, do, if you manipulate corals to make them more heat tolerant by changing their symbionts, does that mean that they grow more slowly, for example, which is one of the things that we think does happen? We're trying to find that happy medium so that the corals can survive into the future, but also continue to grow. How do managers want to deal with that trade-off? Uh, are they happy having more climate resilient corals that perhaps grow more slowly or not? And that's the, an equation that has to be solved for all of the stakeholders involved, whether it's managers, residents, scientists, we're all involved in that decision-making process. The research that we're doing is really interested in looking at all kinds of different ways that we can build the heat tolerance of corals, not just by manipulating their algal symbionts, but also there are certain types of corals that just do well, just do better than others when faced with heat stress. Climate resilience can come from the symbionts, but it can also come from the host or the coral itself. Maybe we can be smart when it comes to coral restoration in how we source corals from different areas to build the heat tolerance or climate resilience of the outplanted corals that we are restoring on reefs. You can actually potentially move corals over very short distances as a way of incrementally building this heat tolerance and sort of buying some time. Local managed relocation is essentially leveraging local thermal habitats in order to identify thermally tolerant corals propagate those corals and use them to reseed degraded assemblages. We've identified a really significant, really interesting thermal gradient along Southeast Florida, with Southern habitats being significantly warmer than more Northern habitats. Southern Miami-Dade around Biscay National Park is, is a little bit warmer than the water off of Miami Beach. And it turns out that the corals that live in those warmer areas are actually slightly more thermally tolerant. We've been investigating whether we could use those to restore reefs in, say, Miami Beach or even further north in Broward County to see if we can sort of help corals keep pace with rising temperatures and climate change. The question is, is have these corals that are potentially more thermally tolerant in these warmer southern areas, is that a result of acclimatization? They're just simply used to it and they've grown up there and so now they've developed this heat tolerance. Or is it an inherent genetic trait? Is it something that can actually be passed on from generation to generation? Historically, most restoration efforts have focused on adult corals, but how do we inject this thermal tolerance into future generations? Sexual reproduction creates new genetic diversity. That's the material that reefs need to keep adapting into the future. Another intervention strategy that we're working on is maximizing the fitness and the survival of juvenile corals after spawning events. Are we helping introduce uh, appropriate genotypes into populations that help them deal with warming temperatures or with other conditions. We're applying the same symbiont manipulation strategies to juveniles so that they can survive bleaching events or heat stress that they experience early on in their lives. And we're also thinking of ways to make the corals themselves stronger from the very beginning of their lives by selectively breeding parents that we've found to be resistant to bleaching or uh, not so susceptible to disease. Trying to crossbreed them against uh, existing genetic diversities on the reef to try to insert more resistant genotypes or, or, or alleles into the population. To create a really resilient new generation of offspring. Studying corals here in Miami provides a really unique opportunity to study an organism and an ecosystem that's just in our backyard. You have that mixture of large human impact with a somewhat mostly functioning reef system. We are looking to protect a highly urbanized area, which is something that's really unique. Human impacts are playing out on a very local scale. Coral reefs provide so much, both for storm protection and food, tourism. I mean, so they're directly impacting our local economies. Everyone who lives here is directly impacted by, you know, the health of coral reefs. We're able to really test important hypotheses about how to 
keep animals from going extinct and try that out right at our doorstep. Local people living here have everything to gain from these kinds of activities. I'm lucky enough that this is happening in my own backyard. So not only do I get to feel like I'm making a difference, but it's actually making a difference to myself, the people around me, my family, my community. And I think that's tremendously rewarding. We have a new grant, which is a multi-partner grant funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Federation to create something called the Southeast Florida Coral Restoration Hub. We're going to be building out a new facility just adjacent to our main Rosenseal campus. And in that facility, we're going to have uh, really a lot more capacity to scale up our activities, to grow corals out in tanks, to microfrag them, plant them out, attempt different sorts of manipulations, and even potentially uh, try to breed some of these organisms. Given that corals are so beautifully complicated, you have to attack it from so many different angles. Partners from local and state governments, from universities, from nonprofits, we're all starting to work together to invest collectively in these coral reef ecosystems. There's a bunch of people working together for the same goal. Really, that's what we need. You know, the, the solution to this crisis is really a lot of people trying a lot of things, funded by a lot of different uh, entities, with the ability to try lots of different things all at once. The good news is, you know, we haven't lost any species from this sort of jigsaw puzzle of coral reefs. We haven't thrown any pieces away. In theory, we could still reassemble that jigsaw puzzle and have the complete picture. And although assembling that jigsaw puzzle may take decades, may take whole careers, um, as a long-term goal, I think it's still feasible. As the situation globally on reefs becomes unfortunately more and more dire, the techniques that we as scientists are allowed to trial are becoming much more diverse. It's a really, really dynamic field for better and for worse. Because corals are experiencing these global dramatic declines, that means that this field in parallel is also evolving really, really rapidly. Even five years ago, the notion that you might want to, let's say, manipulate the algal symbionts, either in the adult corals or in the larvae of the corals, might have been dismissed as not necessarily something that was practical or that someone would actually consider doing on reefs. And we've seen almost a 180 degree shift in attitudes towards that now in 2020. That's kind of where the cutting edge is. It's just an exciting moment to like think outside the box. Now more than ever before, there's an opportunity for your science to be incorporated into these real world questions and challenges. All of these intervention strategies, these restoration efforts, they're all essentially activities that are helping to buy us some time. Unless we are able to reduce our emissions or find some other way of sequestering carbon and removing it from the atmosphere, unless we ultimately deal with the root cause of these problems, all of these solutions are just sort of band-aids on, on the problem. Everything we focus on in the lab is a short-term time scale of how to get corals to survive like a couple decades longer until we can reduce carbon emissions and like fix more environmental problems. It's really important for us as humans to take responsibility for our actions and to do what we can to help the environment that we've altered. On the face of it, things look pretty gloomy, and yet somehow I still remain optimistic. I am personally optimistic. I feel that in one way or another, if you're in this field, you have to be optimistic. Seeing the amount of people, especially non-scientists, that are starting to care about coral reefs really gives me hope for the future. There's still everything to play for.